We had sock and boppers. No. Oh, yes, yes. We you did. had sock and boppers. <laughs> you had them too, Chris. In 1996, Scholastic began publishing Animorphs. Over the next six years, Catherine Applegate and her husband, Michael Grant, under the pseudonym K.A. Applegate, produced 54 main series books, several spinoffs, and inspired a TV series, graphic novels, and a cult following. We can't tell you where we live. We can't even tell you our last names. But we can tell you our thoughts and feelings on this series, book by book. I'm Miranda. I'm Eddie. And I'm Chris. And we are... The The (laughs) Anadorks! These may be kids' books, but we discuss dark themes and mature content. There may also be some explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. I wanted moon shoes. Moon shoes. You're gonna love. You're gonna love my nuts. Shoes. Moon shoes. Shoes. I wanted the glasses. You're gonna love my nuts. I wanted somebody did the the slap like, chop. I feel like sometimes Chris's audio goes out because you just start like <laughs> having your own interaction while we're having a conversation. All right, oh. guys. When do we, when do, let's five minutes we start the episode. So they put Axe yeah. in moon shoes. No, a yeah. box, not moon shoes. They put them in a box. Well, they couldn't get two pairs of moon shoes. That's just not <laughs> three sentence summaries first, right? Oh, okay, okay. But yeah, no. So the eagle eared among you might have noticed that we didn't do this at the beginning of this book because we read the book badly and so now i got a new job (laughs) yeah 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 and chris got weird and lazy and started really reading earthsea all right let's uh let's rock paper scissors for three who wants to rock paper scissors me for three i'll do it all three of us let's all go whoever wins the most gets to do one sentence okay okay all right Rock, paper, scissors, time dot is. No! All right, so <laughs> Eddie, Eddie has to do three sentences. Yeah. Okay. All right, Miranda, all right. That's maybe Rock, the paper, sentence. scissors, time dot is. Oh. Yeah! All right, I get two sentences. <laughs> Rock covers paper, you dumb bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Good old predictable Chris. Always picks Rock. <laughs> Three sentences to summarize. Megamorphs 1, famously titled (laughs) Axe's Last Revenge. Okay, sentence one. Rachel is going to weekend gymnastics camp. (laughs) And so the whole gang decides to take the weekend off from anamorphing. Semicolon. Getting fancy. In, In route, Rachel gets mobbed by birds and... Has a serious bout of amnesia. That's what I meant. Period. Oh no, there's so much that happens in this book. New monster Valik hunts the anamorphs whenever they morph and causes havoc across the city. Finally, Cassie morphs into a whale <laughs> and defeats the Valik with its weakness: colon water. There we go. Wow. <laughs> very detailed. Very wow. detailed. Also very accurate. All right, get ready for this monstrosity. <laughs> After being shunned by local Heather Darlene, <laughs> resident edgelord Marco <laughs> ruins Darlene's birthday swim event. Whilst almost getting everyone killed by morphing in the basement of her house because... and. He did not yet know this, <laughs> but there was a new monster, a new pet of the viscer named Valik, which had been trained to feed on morphing energy. I only get two sentences. <laughs> the goal you had to make faces during my three sentences. <laughs> okay, so where was I? Morphing energy. <laughs> while. Rachel's was supposed to be away at gymnastics camp. Pretty sure that works. <laughs> Rachel, however, didn't tell anyone that she wasn't going to gymnastics camp and got beat up by a bunch of burbs, found herself unconscious, but also found herself not herself in that she couldn't remember who she was, <laughs> tore off through the woods, found a nice old lady who had met the Yerks, 
tried to buy shoes from her and it didn't go well, turned into a bear, got attacked by said Valik from the first thing, ran off some more, only to find herself breaking into houses and facing the cops in elephant form, getting hit by Marco, who was driving Cassie's car. This is dad's um, car. Two sentences. I'm still in my second sentence, bud. <laughs> Racing down the road and then Axe get <laughs> caught by the Valique and taken to Visser's ship where Visser is dandy and swell and then they become friends with the Visser and they have tea with him and they discover that there's really not that much difference between them after all. Okay. Good luck, Miranda. There's a lot of there's a lot of book there. Yeah. And you only hit the important bits too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I really had to cut some stuff. On an increasingly rare quote normal weekend, the kids find themselves spread to different places. Until, of course, Marco decides to crash the party that he had not been invited to and do a little morph there. Which brings in a monster of a whole new kind. You could really say change is in the air. Mm. That was good. That was <laughs> good. Really I hate good. it. <laughs> That's a more, more figurative description of the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was good. One thing I wish I could have caught in my thing. Two anamorphs skydive in this. Yeah, yes, they I do the same trick. The they do yeah. the same trick twice in a row. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So, chapter 28, we're in a box. Yeah, what are those briefcases? Oh. The really oh, good ones? Samsonite. Samsonite? All right, I so we're in a so. Samsonite box. Oh, my God. Box. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Hold a Raymanite box, which is not in any way a reference to the the impenetrable Samsonite briefcase. <laughs> yeah. Actually, so we pick up with Axe again. Axe is a captive of Visser 3's. He's in a Ramonite, Ramonite Ramonite, box. Ramonite, I don't know. And we learned that Ramonite technology is actually what we've been seeing on the Yurk ships, right? Before the doors that... Um, yeah, he says it's a metal... So the quote here is, Ramonite is a metal that can stretch open or be made clear or opaque by molecular realignment. So yeah, like the doors opening out of nowhere and then the cell that fades from clear to to mm -hmm. black. And this has to be what they were in in book five yeah. when they went up to space. Yeah, yeah. And so he gets a little peek and he realizes that he is on the blade ship of yeah. Visser 3. Yeah. Mostly because Visser 3 is there. <laughs> <laughs> on, a, on a raised platform, no oh, is is this your ship? <laughs> <laughs> and he's having a bit of a, a crisis right now, like an internal crisis, because he was confronted by Visser 3. He feels like he should have attempted to kill Visser 3 because he owes his brother. What is it like? He, Andalite Law? Right, as an it, Or warrior. something, or like the honor code is yeah. like, it's his job to like kill this guy for his brother. And yet there's a moment where he thinks, if I try to kill him now, I'll definitely die, but I might survive if I don't. And he feels like he chickens out and doesn't do what he needed to do. Yeah, yeah he refers He's... to it as the burden of revenge, mm. which may not yet be his burden to bear with his youthfulness, but... Well, for all he knows, he's the last one of their family. Yeah. It's true. He says, uh, I felt a, a sick, twisting doubt inside me. This honor is a terrible thing, worse than death for an Andalite warrior. And we have had that impression before, right? That honor means yeah, that too. Yeah. It's so crazy. Axe is in this cell and he's given a chance to see Visser 3. And he knows that that's, you know, that's got to be on purpose. This is something that can be changed at will. So someone's changing it. And he sees all the taxons and the hork bajir running their little machines, which just sounds so cute. Mm -hmm. It really does sound cute. <laughs> I really think we might be on the wrong team, you guys. Yeah. We might be the baddies. <laughs> like, because the taxons are fucking adorable. You just want to hug them. Yeah. You just want to hug them. Axe says that taxons, so he's just explaining what we get every book, that the hork bajir are like this, while the taxons are like this. And he says that taxons <laughs> usually handle the more subtle work. I don't think 
taxons and subtlety belong Any, in the same Nothing is sense. subtle. No, it nothing just, is subtle about I taxons. Guess, I guess he's just saying that hork are like strictly like fighters. And so pressing buttons is the more subtle work yeah. in this case. Yeah. But what if he meant spies? What if he meant yeah. that it's like, oh, yeah, you know, all our espionage is handled by the taxons. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I love the idea of like a taxon, you know, with like a, bi- a big hat reading a newspaper waiting for the drop <laughs> in the park, you know, and like another taxon comes by and just sets down a suitcase. Yeah, like, yeah. that's just good, clean fun right there. That's some spy versus spy shit. Because, you know, if the hork tried to do that when the one got up to leave their elbow blades would get stuck together and they just draw uh-huh. so much attention to themselves. <laughs> It'd be like oh oh god sorry. <laughs> we do I think get our first hork workplace accident this book um, <laughs> later. We're Can you really call it an accident? <laughs> yeah, no. Anyway, um, what happens here is that Visser 3 turns on a hologram. This is so ridiculous. It's the Visser's Clip Show part two. Yeah, yeah. With a live feed. Like. <laughs> Miranda, do Julia Child. I thought you might enjoy watching this. We were lucky to get a visual lock. My valise is closing closing in on another of your band. Soon we'll have company. Uh, so, Got a little Miss Frizzle at the end there. <laughs> yeah, so all of a sudden, Visitor 3 has the ability to live stream what's happening. What is filming this? Double? At one point, we get a your camera. The Valique. No, guess. it's like Valique Cam. Uh, Valique Cam. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, like, it's like when you put a GoPro on your cat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I just wanted to see what he does all day. <laughs> so what Visitor 3 is showing is like the Valique is tearing. It's chasing. Jake, uh, Jake and Tiger Morse. Yeah. So Jake was running back and forth, trying to outrun the Valique. Outrun the Valique. Yeah. And uh, and so that's what we're going flashing back to. And yeah. yes, and immediately is like immediately Visser Three gets a hard on for <laughs> cat, predator cats, large cats, again. and says things the that he in every book when he saw a tiger. <laughs> he has so much going yeah, on. Yeah, I just forgets. I just imagine him Look being how like it moves. <laughs> yeah, he's like his hands are just like right in front of him like this, just waving back and forth. His like, puny oh, andalite oh. hands. Yeah. His puny andalite hands. One of the other animorphs morphs, and so it distracts the Valique. And Visser Three seemingly doesn't know that this is a, a flaw of the Valique. Right. He doesn't know about <laughs> about what we discovered, which was that it will chase the thing that's morphing over the thing that morphed. So Visser 3 becomes irate. He's like, why is the like, why are why aren't we watching the t- like, why isn't he bringing me the tiger? Why am I not seeing tentacles on tigers? <laughs> As we say in the biz. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. More tentacles on tigers. <laughs> More yeah, tentacles on. on tigers. None of this footy is worth it if there's no tentacles on tigers. <laughs> and we get a description of what the Valique does. Yes, it's a it's about to because a, a trembling engineer is like. You know, uh, we, 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 you know, our knowledge of the creature is, isn't perfect, sir. I can only speculate. Speculate quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and the engineer explains the Valik feeds on energy and they have somehow, and later Axe will allude to this being very simple somehow. And like, oh yes, of yeah. course they could do this. They're like, oh, we're going to make it eat morphing energy, which is a specific kind of energy, which they have examples of because Visser 3 can morph. And it'll learn, it'll learn to, no, it'll learn to chase morphing energy. But not eat it. But not eat it. It wants to eat the kind of energy that our ship's engines output. But we're going to make it ask permission first. And so we're going to get it to go get the things, we're going to train it to catch the things that are morphing, bring them to us, and then we'll feed it with our ship's engines, which we did by reprogramming its biology. Yeah, that's some, it's some crisper, (laughs) it's some crisper shit. Visser 3 gets frustrated by this uh, limitation of his pet. So Visser 3 launches the bug fighters. Yes. The taxon speaks. Sweeney, and then <laughs> Mr. Three's like, Shut the fuck up! And he lashes uh, his andalite tail. 
Uh-huh. And I just hear like an R two D two getting exploded noise. You know what I mean? Like, uh-huh. the uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! It definitely sounds like R two. Yeah, yeah, it definitely, <laughs> definitely sounds like that. Apparently, the taxon was raising the concern of it's. It's quite difficult to keep the the cat's GoPro actually trained on any <laughs> one item. Yeah, yeah uh, it'll and, go where the cat goes. Like, <laughs> yeah, and that's you know, and then um, you know, he regains his temper. And uh, he says, uh, this creature says it's difficult to keep a visual lock on the Valique. Does anyone else think it's difficult to follow my orders? It's kind of simple. And no one says yes. (laughs) And And, uh, he launches the blood fighters and they start eating the other taxon, which that means two people aren't working now. He killed that taxon and the vibe. Like yeah. the room yeah. is dead. Like nobody's having any fun yeah. anymore. <laughs> like, but Visser Three takes the opportunity to describe exactly what's he. He starts narrating. Ah, uh, your Andalite brothers have found a weakness in my Valique. They are playing games, morphing here, morphing there, whipping it from place to place. Always <laughs> with the morphing. <laughs> but you forget my little Andalite. And in friend. such small portions. <laughs> I in, I inhabit an Andalite body with full morphing powers. I know your weakness, too. Why is he reminding us that he can morph here? But also, what weakness yeah. does he mean? What like He's like, I know your weakness, too. And I'm like, but what is it? We don't. Oh, I think yeah. I know. I think they can't play this game for long. He's reminding us that it's you get exhausted from morphing. Too or you rapidly. get stuck after two hours. Yeah, that too. But, yeah. But the fact that you get exhausted from morphing is why Cassie has to do the final. Oh yeah, thing yeah. Here. Okay, yeah. So he's saying, I know your weakness is that you can't do this yeah. very long. Okay, get I get it. Yeah. Yeah. And he was he was just saying, you know, tigers looking tired too. Like, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. He turns all four of his eyes to look at Axe um, in a leering, deadly gaze, and he was like, "I would like to take them alive." For my own reasons. But if I can't, I will make do, which I don't know what do is, but uh, with their lifeless bodies, (laughs) which is horrifying. What kind of food do you think do (laughs) it? Well, like fondue? I think he meant stew. I think he meant stew Stew. there. He meant, but if I can't, I will make stew with their lifeless bodies. Got it, got it. That makes way more sense. Yeah, because it's easy. You just get all the... Bodies into a big thing of water. And Let, you the just bodies sort of hit the Let the bodies hit the pan. Let the bodies hit the pan. Hit the pan. <laughs> uh, and you know we're at Marco next chapter because it opens with crunch, crunch. Screech. screech, bam, wham, bump, squeal. <laughs> so Marco's driving. He's still driving Cassie's dad's truck. Yeah. For those who remember, Marco is driving Cassie's dad's truck. He dropped Cassie off with Rachel, and he went tearing off in the truck. And he dropped Jake in the woods and the, as a tiger. Right. Yes. right. Yeah. And his general idea here is to morph while moving seventy miles an hour plus. That's what he's hoping he'll accomplish. That's what um, it feels like to merge every day. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> I look right. I look left. I do my cross. <laughs> <laughs> so he he starts morphing. He says, "Time for the monkey suit." I no. He needs to workshop that. Yeah, line. it's not like, great. Not it's good. a high stress situation. <laughs> yeah, he reminds us that he's not the biggest guy in the world. He's kind of short, kind of small. But when he yeah. does morph, he's so massively powerful. It's incredible. And he says that he is in this gorilla morph. He has lifted guys up and thrown them through the air. In this morph, he has punched Hort Bajir and they stayed punched. And I'm I think that means he killed them, right? Like, died. Yeah, they died. Yeah. yeah. And then he says, in this morph, I could kick the hot butts of the entire <laughs> Dallas Cowboys just all at once. Whole yeah. line of them. Yeah. Whole yeah. line of butts. Yeah. Just one, like, and all of them going, ooh. <laughs> he also says, um, he was talking about the sensation of morphing, and he was like, I can feel my shoulders doubling, thruppling, quadrupling. He did that it was in a his rush. first book, too. Remember? Mm-hmm. He was like, I must have been four, five, six times as strong. <laughs> <laughs> like, sequentially? Or yeah. like- <laughs> well remembered. Yeah, I do remember that. Because it's also like, any specificity like that in these books is just begging for argument from yeah. a sci-fi nerd. So Marco's driving through the trees. Oh, we got a lot of uh, adjectival hyphenated phrases here. 
Hardcore baddest bag can be. Don't even look at me cross-eyed. Shoulders like a cement truck. Neck like a fire hydrant. Fists like sledgehammer. Dominant. Fists like slender man. Dominant <laughs> male. Like <laughs> Silverback, slenderback crew. No. Slender. <laughs> and so, yeah, he's driving and he looks in his rearview mirror and he sees a cloud of dust heading for him and he accelerates and that's it. That's the shortest chapter in the book and it's over. Uh, that might not be true. Please don't at me, but like yeah. it feels really short. It's real short. Yeah. It might be that I'll, I'm going on the record and fucking prove me wrong. Anna Dork's out there. This is the shortest chapter in the entire canon. <laughs> okay. We're going to find out the last page of the book or like the last chapter in the series just says it is finished. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> chapter 69. It, it is finished. Is finished. <laughs> Epilogue. Nice. <laughs> oh, I hope Epilogue, there's no somehow not until page 420. But <laughs> So we cut back to Rachel. Rachel's an elephant. She's remembered Cassie at this point, right. sort of. And she's running with Cassie on her back. Yeah. Yeah. And Cassie's catching her up. She's like, you're Rachel. You're an animorph. We were created by a dying Andalite Prince Charming. I mean, Prince. Interesting choice. Created. We were created. Yeah, created by. Yeah. yeah like, like, you know, I hope that that someday is on my wiki. By. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Incorporate. Like, he's the founder of the animorphs, yeah. but I wouldn't say created. No, by. Right. Like Marco's the founder. That's a tough call. That's a tough <laughs> he's call. He's creative lead. Marco was on the marketing department. Yes. So, yes, yeah, so Rachel's remembering horrible, horrible things and is like, wow, that sucks. And then she's like, I see a hawk. And she's like, yeah, that's your boyfriend. I mean, Tobias. Yeah. And <laughs> that's this guy you have a crush on. And he's then, a bird. <laughs> and then Rachel just starts like tearing down cousin. people's fences and like charging uh -huh. through fences and now she's out of but the has house. But has the thought, has the thought, like insurance will cover this. This is a force <laughs> majeure. Yeah. It's, uh... And then they're out of the houses and running for the woods. And then she's like, oh yeah, there was a crazy lady yelling about yerks in the woods. And Cassie's like, they're real. And then asks no follow up questions. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. it's like, take your time, but we need to fight. Yeah, the thing that really blew my mind in this section, Cassie is also catching Rachel up on the plan. I'm sure you just touched upon this a little bit, but like the plan specifically of this Valique feeding on morphing. And so just trying to explain, it's like, we're trying to morph, we're trying to keep the ball in the air. It chases after morphing energy. It's drawn to anyone morphing. So we're morphing every five minutes or so, hoping to wear it out. Rachel then validly asks, how do you know when it wears out? Cassie replies, we don't. Rachel says, this isn't much of a plan. Are you Animorphs always this hopeless? And Cassie replies, pretty much. And like... They need to have a team chat about this later. They need to have a sit down and sort of a process review. And like, they need to just talk about their danger factor. They need to talk about risk assessment. Well, Rachel and leans into it. And she's like, hopeless fights are the best kind. They're the only kind worth fighting. Let's fucking go. Yeah. But that's what I would say if my only option was double or nothing. That's true. Like if, if I'm backed up against the wall and I'm like, I just, I think, you know, Rachel's playing the hand she was dealt. She recently had amnesia. Yeah, and she still does. Rachel's <laughs> memory is only just coming back and she already has one of the better ideas, which is if the Valique can't lift Rachel, which we saw at the end of last part, then it can't lift a squirrel that's on Rachel. So Cassie should just stay on her back while she morphs. Yeah, Cass that would Cassie morphs into a squirrel so that she can't be separated. Right. From so that she's nice she and just small. Grips. She can just hide. We just cut back to Marco. Ah, uh, shit, you guys. This chapter is shorter than the last Marco <laughs> chapter. Fuck! <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the one we were talking back about at that time. <laughs> <laughs> um, is he good cover? Good cover. Yeah, he goes screaming through the woods, managing to avoid trees somehow, and he slams the brakes, runs into Rachel, gets thrown from the car. Oh, the bug fighters are chasing him too. Yeah, yeah. He gets thrown from the car, sees yeah. the Drake on beams. It's so crazy to me that he hit Rachel. Yeah, like I have so much trouble understanding the spatialness of how because I think we're jumping around a little bit in time with each of these chapters. Yes. Like it's like and just the annoying part is like 
just like five minutes. But sometimes it's 15. Sometimes and sometimes it's, it's nothing. Like, yes. Yeah, sometimes it's like you pick up literally in the moment. But it's like, so I like, feel like they should have put a clock. Like, you know, books that oh, do that. Oh, that would have been mm-hmm. so cool. That would have been so cool. Yeah. Drake on beams apparently sound an awful lot like a red-tailed hawk. Tsew. They go, tsew, tsew, tsew. Tsew. Everything's escalating. The Valik arrives while Marco is in the ditch. Unco- like oh, slip. yeah, he crashes at like 70 miles per hour. That's what he yeah. crashes eject- into. Forcibly ejected Rachel, from right? the car. Yes. So oh he my- hit Rachel at 70 miles per hour, yeah? He did, yes. That's insane. And then insane. he uh, is launched from the car. He hears agonized trumpeting from the elephant that he hit, and he passes out. Yeah. We cut back to Cassie. Mm-hmm. She's still morphing. And then we meet where our last chapter just ended. And right. there's Dracon beams and all these things and swirling light and everything everywhere. But so like now we get from Cassie's perspective, I felt a surge as Rachel powered her huge body faster. What is happening? And then headlights too close. Bam. I flew tumbling through the air, a twisted half formed creature. I landed hard, but my fall was cushioned by dense bushes. I think a discussion about Rachel's obliterated leg. Is that true? Well, we get a description that she's on her side, trumpeting yeah. in pain and rage. And there's an overturned truck with a gorilla laying outside it, struggling to get up. But what I wanted to get on this page was Rachel crying in pain as an elephant. And then Cassie saying in the narration, I smell burned flesh. Yes. Like that is so... So, like, this book is just so much more graphic. It It is is like, like, it is so graphic. Like, we've had, like, Rachel marching around as a two pawed bear already and bleeding out into a small creek. And then she's not only recovered from that, but like, more is happening. Not only that, so there's also a moment where she gets shot by a Dracon beam. Yes. And Cassie says, I saw a seared line of blackened flesh drawn down Rachel's side by a And the thing beam. that's so scary about that is like they talk about dra- Dracon beams cutting through rock in the quarry, yeah. mm-hmm. like seeming to like cut deep into the ground. Like Rachel is very, 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 very injured. Yeah. Yes. This is so bad. Not- this is like we mentioned what happened to her before as a bear that lost its paws. She's also been kidnapped by a stranger and locked in a basement. And then the shack was set on fire while she was in its basement. She has amnesia. She has not. The cops uh-huh. tried to burst into a house that she was staying in. She's had one of the worst days of at least the last two weeks. Mm-hmm. Easily. <laughs> yeah. Easily. So Cassie has been thrown off of Rachel And she sees that the beast is settling over them and it's sort of spread out over the three of them. And she realizes that if she morphs, it will definitely choose to take her. But right now, it could choose any of the three of them. Yeah. And this brings her back to her Chekhov's dream in the (laughs) earlier part of the book where she had another premonition in her dream. She had to pick who gets to live, her or another. And she just blacks out. Yeah. So we don't know if she what she decided to do. Yeah. Moment, like right? this is like a the one thing I will say about this book is it is a nauseating Russian doll cliffhanger yeah. scenario. Like I feel like the chapters are just ending on like pointier and pointier notes pretty much until this chapter. This chapter is when tension starts yeah, to break a little bit. To, chapter yeah. 33. So chapter back to 33. Axe as a narrator. Axe is Seeing all this, we find out the hologram was left up for him and he's had video feeds from those bug fighters showing him. <laughs> it's like a sleepover where like Visser 3 is like, I'm going to bed. Do you want me to turn off the movie? And it's like, no, no, no. I always fall asleep watching something. This is great. <laughs> so he sees Rachel being shot at, the truck hitting her and... The Valique lowers down on something, right? Yes, it's hovering over the scene. It drops down to a ditch we're told here, and we know that Marco was in a ditch by the side of the road. Yeah. Right. We know because so we have f- imper- we, we Right, like, but Axe as, does as, not uh, know observers, that. Visser right, 3 doesn't know is that. Right. so pleased. He's having the time of his life. He says, come he's to me, my so little hyped. cat. 
Bring me my Bring second. Bring me end. a second end like bandit. <laughs> You'll have company soon, yeah, and you know what that means. Did already say that? A dinner party, probably. <laughs> did he already say like you'll have company, <laughs> think, or yeah. soon there will be company. Like I, in the door chancing comes company. company. <laughs> Bobby, 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 Visser, Bobby, baby, Visser, Bobby, Visser, Visser, Bobby, Visser. Visser, Visser Bubby, Visser, <laughs> <Mr>. so- Bubby. <laughs> Visser, come on over for dinner. <laughs> Visser three tells um he calls the bug fighters. He wants them to hold the other the elephant down, right? But we don't know he's talking about the elephant. He says hold that large creature because the reader doesn't know if they're bringing Rachel or um, <laughs> Cassie, yeah, or Cassie right now. Yes, or Marco. One of the human controllers says that it might draw less attention if they send human controllers, right? Rather- Zookeeper controllers now. Yes. Elephant yeah. tamer controllers. Yeah. <laughs> because the bug fighters are piloted by taxons and hork bashir and that might cause some problems, although they've already had a- right. all these other things going on, like a tornado they draw monster. draw a little attention. So Visser 3 is like, yes, yeah, send, send the stupid humans, whatever. Don't let the Andalites see anything. He, he says, blank the Andalites cage. And I'm like, yeah, I, like, is that a I was censor so, word? Oh, like, what would you I was say? Like, Fuck I, the yeah. Andalites cage. <laughs> well, because he's going to his quarters, he says. He's going to go hang and out And he doesn't want him again. to know where that yeah, is. Yeah, like I yeah. said, slumber party's yeah. over. <laughs> and then Axe, like, is in the dark and... This is this was actually kind of mind blowing. This is like they might have actually made an outline for this crazy, yeah, crazy they did. book. This one they had because to. it really shows. Because um, earlier in the book, Marco was rationing Axe's access to um, flea, flea powder. powder, which means that right now in this moment when we're in our Ramanite, 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 Samsonite. Once we're now that we're in our Samsonite cell. And he gets bitten by a flea. It gives him a little light bulb above his head. And he's like, oh, Prince Jake. Prince Jake was once a flea. I love fleas. And I love Prince Jake. He I actually, would love to be a flea. He actually does at one point just say Jake. I Actually, for a second, I misread the thing that was happening and thought maybe he was so desperate he hoped Jake was spying on him. Aww. That's actually <laughs> like, that's what I thought this page was trying to convey. And then I was like, oh, no, he's having an idea. Yes. Yeah, you're right. He, he does. does just say Jake. He realizes he could morph the flea and then maybe... With the cage looking empty, someone might open it to come in and inspect and he could get out. And the thing that's really crazy to me that's hitting me in this moment is we're about to see some next level shit. So we have the Valik that's warping around from morph to morph, but now he's about to go into a description of what a flea can do. And there's a lot of good stuff I'm sure you guys will want to hit about the morph because he does he does the classic like morphing isn't as straightforward as you might <laughs> guess. But like after like doing his whole like I morphed and it was gross, he talks about how the flea's whole telos, like its whole deal, is that it wants to move towards warm, blood-filled bodies. Mm -hmm. And it's a micro version of the Valik strategy. It's the same thing. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, he's going to turn into the flea, and that, and we're, we haven't gotten to this part yet. Like, I did not realize at this point that that's where this was going. But in the next few steps, we're going to see that he uses the flea in two ways. One, to target blood-filled bodies that aren't morphing, and then to demorph a little bit and put the Valique's attention onto mm-hmm. incidental targets as an attack. It's brilliant. It's, like, actually one of the cooler, cuter... It, to me, is, like... I can't tell what magic these books are working on my brain anymore. Seriously, like, I don't know what cleverness is. I might be getting dumber. <laughs> but, like, I I think when you look at this as actually a solution for them to get out of this situation, it's more elegant, in my opinion, than the actual resolution of the Valik in the book in terms of using elements that have already been put into play. Like, I was flattered by the Megamorphs book. It really elevated in terms of planning and execution and cleverness, and I really liked it. Uh, The only thing I really wanted to hit in the actual morph from Andalite to Flea is he uses the phrase, my complex Andalite heart. This is the one thing I wanted to hit, too. We gotta gotta (laughs) talk about this, because first of all, Time Lords. Yes, yeah, first of all, all, multiple hearts. (laughs) Multiple hearts. What does that mean, Time Lords? Time Lords have two hearts. Time Lords have two hearts, and they use it as a plot device a lot. Doctor Who, Uh, sorry. And then 
my complex Andalite hearts, are they complex because more complex hearts are required for higher for love? forms love. of love? For higher forms of love? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good memoir yes. title for Axe, though, someday, My Complex Andalite Hearts. Think it oh, can... oh, you're right. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's, that's going in the fucking musical. That's going <laughs> my, my complex, complex Andalite, Andalite Heart. Heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he's a flea. This is ridiculous, though. I like do like so much of the flea stuff, but they have an Andalite in a cage, and the thing they don't account for, they close the windows, and the thing they don't account for <laughs> is that he might morph. And he also says, okay, it seems like they it could have been possible... Axe doesn't have a, a small morph from his own planet, right? But he says that there are animals on his planet who are as small as fleas. Is that right? Mm, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, we had very few animals that's that small on my own world. Perhaps the same was true of the Yurks. The Visser would not expect me to morph anything, something so tiny. Okay, so they do. Oh, account for so they try to. They try. Yeah. Yeah. And then he also can hear the Visser coming because he's always speaking to everyone. He like never private thoughts. Speaks. Yeah, they they have a new yeah. terminology for it. Open. They, I think they call it broadcasting before this, but Axe calls it open thought speak, which can be heard by anyone. Closed thought speak is like a human whispering to only one person. It's closed Except- because it's in the brackets. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Axe hears this or three coming. Yeah. And he's shouting and he's like, oh, open the hatch, you idiot. Oh, oh where is that leak? I'm like, yeah. oh, oh. Yeah. Now he's a basset hound for some reason. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. So they open the hatch. And bright, the and then know. and then brighten the Andalite's cage. Yes. Where's the Valik, you idiot? Yeah. No, where's where's the Andalite? Right. So they turn on the lights. There's no one there. One of them goes in, and he's like, "You're an idiot. Why are you opening the fucking cage?" And he's like, "I do what flea do. I jump. Yeah. I I jump toward warm thing." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he jumps toward warm thing, and he uh, makes it out on the living thing that runs out of the cage. And Visser 3 screams, close the cage. And then there's a movement in air in the air just above X. And then uh, he falls. And he can tell already that this creature he was on no longer smelled like life. Yeah. And it was a Hork Bajir, is yeah. what we found out, right? Yeah, yeah. I believe so. Yeah. And it had been a it had been 200 days since any workplace yeah. accidents had taken place. It was uh So we go to yeah. Marco. Yeah. I like this opening. Marco. So Marco, Marco, we find out, is the one being carried away by the Valique. And Marco says, despite the fact that we had kind of figured out that the dust creature wasn't actually trying to eat us, I was still slightly worried as it wrapped me up out of the ditch and carried me away. Slightly worried, as in crying like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> He's honest. Yes. He's, he's, you honest. Know, he's, he's honest. He's always honest. Then you get a bunch of Star Trek references as he arrives. At it's the... true. It's true. So Marco sees Visser 3 with hork blood on his tail. And he said, murderer. <laughs> <laughs> and a circle of hork armed with Dracon beams. And they're like, Visser 3 murderer? That's impossible. And Visser 3's like, why do you always not fucking morph? Just morph out. I know you're not a fucking gorilla. And he's like, I don't say anything because we never say anything to Visser 3 for I'm fear just he'll a gorilla smell our humanness. Yeah. <laughs> so Visser 3 says, find that Andalite, bring in the bio scanners. Uh, he didn't disappear. But I don't even think... I don't even think the bioscanners are about like telling whether or not they're Andalite or human, no, right? No, no, the just bio to find scanner the is just to find the flea. Yeah, yeah. to find the flea. Yeah, yeah, to yeah, find yeah. a flea in the Visser stack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's like, fine, you stay in your stupid morph. Somebody bring me the bioscanner to find the Andalite. <laughs> right, right. And um, Axe starts thought speaking to Marco. Marco, is that you? It's Axe. They confirm that Visser 3 can't hear them talking because they're speaking directly right. to each other. Which means they should be clear to like send nudes and stuff (laughs) and like. (laughs) Yeah. And Axe has a plan. And his plan is to be on Visser 3 because that's the person least likely to get shot right now. Yeah. He asked Marco, (laughs) do you see a computer console nearby? There will probably be a taxon working subtly on it. Yes. And they have a computer work is subtle work. Yeah. 
It is subtle work because they don't even have keypads with buttons. You merely put your hand on it and then yeah. think what you want the computer to yeah. do. That's right. Yeah, it, be, that's what Axe explains to him. He's like, you need to find that and you just need to like touch a pad and just think what you want it want to happen. And the, the one other thing is he says, you put your hand on it and think open hatch. Just think. Just open, open hatch. hatch. Yeah. And he's like, why, why would I want to do that? And he's like, just fucking do it just this once, Marco. Just don't <laughs> ask questions. Don't ruin this. I did the stupid Darlene's party thing for you. You have to yeah, do this for me. I should have brought that up. But he actually laughs. He laughs kind of like the Elemist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he says, so the Valik goes after morphing energy, right? So I'm going to give it something to go after. And using... Rachel and Cassie's plan from earlier of morph small thing on large things so that the Valique can't get them. Well, this or three is not that big. So morph small thing on other small thing. Ooh, not so good. Valique Mm -hmm. want want grab. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Or as Marco says, the Valique was going totally tornado as it picks up, as it wraps around (laughs) Visser 3. That's nice. That's nice. That's right. Because Axe executes his plan, hops on Visser 3's, or he's already on Visser 3's back. He morphs and the Valique goes insane. And then. Then Marco opens the hatch and discovers a couple things about the situation they're in. (laughs) They had thought that they were maybe in space, which if opening the hatch had happened in space, that would have been a lot worse. They would have been sucked out into the vacuum of space. But they took that risk and they won and they found out that there were clouds above them and they were actually just in the upper atmosphere. At this same time, also, um, Visser 3, as the Valique starts to suck him up, Visser 3 starts screaming, water! Water. Yeah. And they're like, what? He's thirsty now? <laughs> like, why? Like, and for a while, I was like, maybe like Visser is more dependent on water than we thought. Or yeah. something. Like, I was confused so, by this for a so while. So, as Axe is morphing out and the Visser is screaming for water, Axe notices something about the particles in the dust storm. Right, because he's flea sized. He's flea sized. And so he gets the Valique onto the Visser and then jumps off. And this is when he collides with one of the particles of the dust storm. Right. And he notices that it's this tiny, tiny individual live creature. Yeah, like a like a flea sized bug, but a little bit smaller because it grabbed onto his leg. And, and it's got a hundred tiny wings that beat mm-hmm. constantly. And we learn that this creature, this cloud-like creature that turns into a tornado, is actually a swarm, which again hits an echo against everything we've seen so far. An echo off the ants, an echo off the yurks, an echo off all the sort of like anti-collectivist, mm. anti-hive like hive mind. Very true. And again, I think they hit it really obviously in this because this is Marco's chapter and he started off by saying all this shit about Star Trek, but like, and specifically Next Generation. True. Well, Borg, so some of it was original. But specifically, it's like I'm on the Enterprise, like the Borg being the monster. I really think, I don't know what it is, but this idea that collectivist goals, that collective action, that like, you know, for the greater good, all this stuff, it's very (laughs) anti-communist. It's very like, and it, and you know, the joke we were making a minute ago about like them being anti-public transit, it just feels like a continuous thread where a group could not merely be optimizing. It has to be conspired. Right. And I don't think, I don't think your implication there is that Kay Applegate and Michael Grant, at least I don't think there's any indication that they hold those beliefs. I don't think, no, I don't think they hold this belief. Something maybe that was in the ether at the time. Yeah, yeah. totally. And I think that it the it Cold makes War perfect. just ended. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like and and individualism is such like it's such I an mean, American yeah, no, ideal. Totally. Such an American talk trait. about and talk about millennials. Like we were, you know, what did they say? They were, I think the reason why we're all called liberal snowflakes is because we were all raised to think each of us are special. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We and it's are, like God each of us is it. each of us is unique, and it's true. We are. Uh-huh. <laughs> <And> <laughs> right. podcast. podcast really is the participation trophy of media formats. <laughs> media formats. <laughs> the Valique was not one creature. It was billions. It was a swarm of billions of these tiny creatures. They had evolved into a swarm that could come together and become a destructive <laughs> entity of gnashing teeth and slicing blades. They love why this. they chose to look that way. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. 
I would look uh, cute if I had the yeah, choice. Yeah, if I was a, if I was a swarm, <laughs> if I was a hive mind, come on. Like you can kill and look cute. It's fine. Yes, like, agree. But I get it. You want to be taken seriously. I get it. I get it. Then in that swarm, as we you know we heard a call for water from Visser Three earlier, and uh, Chekhov's we, water. We start to see that water as Axe is still a little bitty like what unmorphing flea. flea he falls down and he's choking in it but he manages to land on ground that's dry enough that he gets out of the drop of water and he then calls out to marco and is like stamp your feet i need to find you and marco's like i uh i'm a little busy and he's like just fucking stop like what it just stop your feet yeah yeah you it's jackass. super easy yeah, marco's been at <laughs> yeah. a standoff with these hork bajir for a bit now <laughs> he's just been standing there apparently not fighting them <laughs> but yeah. axe does manage to jump to him he lands on marco and marco jumps out of the hatch right he tells him to axe is like jump out of the hatch and he's like Okay, uh, sure. Uh, he uses a couple orc bajir as a ladder and climbed over them to get out of the hatch. And yeah, and uh, yeah. the the bad news is that they're now plummeting toward the earth from about two miles yeah, up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is the chapter. Yeah. Now we're on chapter 36. This is the thing that just really, like, I was, like, reading this and I was like, I need to sit down. The truck hit my back right leg. So we're, like, back in time. Yeah, we're all like, the Marco way back is now to that. driving the stupid truck. The truck hit my back right leg. It must have shattered the bone because the pain was incredible. The impact knocked me several feet and I fell and my head slammed on the concrete. Maybe that's what did it. <laughs> I, I I don't think people should try and cure their amnesia by hitting their yeah. head that again. That is how they cure it in all TV shows. Though. Okay, you're yeah. right about that. You're right. So Rachel gets all her memories yes. back. Yes. And when she wakes up, She's still, still an, an elephant, elephant and she's kind of obliterated. She even remembers Marco's trademark and that it was Marco that came up with it, which is just a nice <laughs> little, nice little it like, is, oh, is. yeah, he is a piece of shit, but he is clever and he came up with our good marketing. And then she has a memory and remembers the all important word thermals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she wakes up and Cassie tells her that it took Marco and Cassie is really upset She's like, it took Marco and I didn't do anything. Then Rachel reveals that her memory's back. Cassie's like, OK, that's that's at least sort of good. And they see the two bug fighters hovering over them. Rachel says that she can't stand up because the elephant's leg mm -hmm. is broken and she's going to have to morph back to human. Cassie says she's going to do it, too. And then she she and just brings up again. I should have morphed while the dust beast was here. I could have drawn it away from Marco. She's stuck on this. She says she was scared. Rachel says, of course you were scared. So was I. Real quick, I do just want to touch on in this chapter at this moment, she remembers that she was swarmed by a bunch of smaller birds. Mm -hmm. What was the species of bird? God damn it. Yeah, she says blackbirds. Yeah, which is not what she had said earlier in the book, right? But I think Tobias sees a mob of blue jays attack a bald mm -hmm. eagle. He That's says. true. And he was far away it and he has better been, eyesight. It could have been a different bald eagle but anyway I, don't I just wanted to touch on the fact that like she's now identifying a swarm that had acted against her oh, like yeah, yeah, just yeah, yeah, that yeah. as a resonant literary okay, echo yeah. that's all nice i'm going to right, yeah. no you're tracking the anti-swarm agenda in these books which is yeah yeah, yeah. anti-swarm agenda yeah. that's what i'm working on so rachel wonders why the monster isn't coming after them this time they're morphing and Cassie figures it's probably because it took Marco and it's got to take Marco back to wherever it's going. Bear in mind, she doesn't know any of the stuff about the creature. Axe is the only right, one who knows right. the stuff about the Valik. So Cassie's like losing it and she's like, it could be killing him. It could be doing anything. It could be, you know, and Rachel's like, look, what happened happened and we have to keep moving. Yeah. Very Rachel vibe. Cassie, I don't remember. I said, can we morph again so quickly? Yes, yes, we can. It's exhausting, though, but we don't have a choice. So that's, again, them hitting that note that rapidly changing morphs is exhausting. So they go to owl morphs and they manage to escape the bug fighters because the police are coming and we know those are the human controllers that Visser 3 sent. Right. And some hork bashirs, right? Like they're like, they're yes. like hork bashirs sort of like slashing up at them and they're like, oh, we have to fly and Jake away. Shows up or as a tiger and helps them escape. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And wow. um, they manage to escape. And Jake asks right before the chapter ends, let me know if I'm missing anything. What about Marco? Have you seen Marco? You know, this is the first time Jake realizes that Marco is 
not yes, with them. Yes, yeah. That he got fully we, taken. But we get to cut right back to Marco. Yeah. And this chapter, I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure to shut up a bunch during this chapter because I can hear Eddie being stoked at how hammy this chapter is. It's like, really this good. Is, it's so it's hammy. A good chapter. I wasn't that specially excited. Why? What are you hearing? Oh my god, it starts off with him screaming in thought <laughs> speak, and literally the next and the next sentence or whatever that's uttered is Ax saying, you know it's thought speak, right? Like you're <laughs> killing me Marco, by like broadcasting why are you this screaming? to me. Like you literally don't like you could just make you could vocalize yeah. or something, <laughs> but instead you're thought oh, speaking so, it straight so from my yeah. brain. Yeah. yeah. Marco gets a cute little line. He says, I don't think in the entire history of planet Earth that any gorilla has ever plummeted through the night from a height of two miles. So it was a first for both of <laughs> yeah. us. Both is in quotes <laughs> for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> Him and the gorilla? <laughs> Him and the Earth? Yeah. <laughs> it is him and the Earth. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. <laughs> At some point, Axe tells Marco... Marco, you're an anamorph, morph into a bird. And Marco's like really kind of, really kind of a little embarrassed that he yeah. doesn't think of that himself. Yeah. And then he morphs back into a human and continues yelling. Like it's such a good bit. And then Axe starts yeah. yelling. <laughs> I wonder how long it takes to fall from two minutes, from two miles. A pretty long time. Two miles seems to get us 80 seconds. With air resistance, according to this calculator. It's not that much time, though. No. And no, they, he, he, yeah, he they does. have to morph really yeah. fucking quick. But he he gets real close to hitting the ground. Yeah, just he sure inches do. off the freshly painted blacktop when he finally flies. Spreads um, his yeah. wings. But they took it well, because Axe goes, that was exciting. Yes, it was. Let's never, ever do that again. Ever, Axe agreed. And then Axe replies, yeah. ever. Yeah. Very cute. Forever? It's very what cute. What matters is yeah, that they flirted. So, we have a lot of book to get through. I'm going to say it into the podcast right here. Let's see what we can do, y'all. I think we can pull Let's it off. See. I think we can do it. Chapter yeah. 38, Jake. Jake returning home after they went on the wildest bender of crashing Cassie's dad car, turning into an elephant, getting hit by a truck, stealing Cassie's dad's truck, getting chased by cops, getting chased by Herc Bajir, taken up to an airship, and they get back at what, like no, 10 midnight. in the morning? Well, they haven't been taken up, just to midnight? clarify, they haven't been taken up to the airship. They didn't yeah. do that. Yes. Um, uh, as for me, I dragged myself home at almost midnight. There was no question. I was grounded. I didn't even argue. No TV. No Sega. Inside the house by 5 o'clock. Why? Wash all the dishes, take out all the trash for two weeks, and oh, by the way, clean out the garage. Animorphs mm-hmm. is taking a stance on the console wars. Yes. And they're backing Sega. Sonic! Green Hill Zone <laughs> in my background! He went up to sleep thinking that his friends were being tortured or killed, and he has this moment where he thinks like, we lost. We just lost two people. We lost Axe and Marco. We Animorphs were finished. The battle was done. Nothing now stood between the Yurks and complete control of the Earth. And you know what? That thought just made me feel relieved. I was too tired to fight. Too tired. So before it turns, is this our Toy Story 3 moment of the book? This one doesn't have you know a what? Really it's bad a cool one. Yeah. it's a cool it's a cool Toy Story 3 moment because it's so abstract yeah. in this yeah. moment. So, as he was no doubt expecting, he goes to sleep and he wakes up to Booga 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 booga. What? <laughs> Which is how Eddie wakes me every time <laughs> I stay over. <laughs> and it's Marco. And he starts laughing. He thinks it's really he funny. He so hard he starts crying. How uh-huh. freaked out that Mar- that Jake is that he's still alive. He yeah. thinks it's like, ha you thought I was dead. <laughs> Cassie said the fleet carried you away. Yeah, it did. And now we're going steady. <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> we're alive and waiting for you to come and lead the counterattack. My favorite thing here is that Marco went into reconnaissance on how he can get out of being grounded yeah. early. That's true. Like Marco's like, hey, like, what's up? What's happening? And his dad's like, dude, Jake just got grounded real bad. And he's like, hey, can I bum a smoke? And his dad's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and they're like sitting there smoking cigarettes in the garage. And it's like, this garage looks a mess. And it's like. Yeah, Mrs. Jake is really getting on me for it. <laughs> it's like, it would be a real shame if you weren't able to get it done in time. You know it could help you with that, Jake. 
and like the politicking never ends in this family like it's just because apparently like apparently he's just gonna clean the garage for three hours and be not grounded for five months yeah that's yeah marco has has negotiated a deal hi charisma so tobias who you may have realized we didn't hear from in a little while Mm -hmm. huh he yeah. wasn't really part of the last bit of the plan, was he? No. It turns out, yeah, he was napping. He was taking a little snooze. Mm-hmm. You know, hawks are daytime creatures. You know, they got to get their beauty mm-hmm. rest. And he just succinctly sums up everything that happened. Basically, the whole book. He's like playing tag with some dust monster from Saturn. Rachel having amnesia till Marco plowed into her with a truck. Escaping from Visser 3's blade ship. And I'm sleeping the entire time? No way. I miss all the fun. <laughs> That's how Tobias needs to be ripped from now Jake, on. Jake kind of rubs it in. He says, you're the only one who can't morph. So the Valique is an interesting. And he says it matter of factly. What yeah, an ass. Yeah. yeah. It's the morphing that this Valique really gets hot for. I mean, it goes out. <laughs> Believe me, you don't want the attention. But really, it's like when somebody says that to you, you're just yeah. jealous. Like it's, we get a lot yeah. of Cassie from this point forward. So Tobias threatens to shit on yeah. Marco and I want to talk about it. I yeah. don't want to skip it. This is technically a Cassie chapter. Threatens to poop? But Marco says a joke to him. He's like, yeah, it's interested in energy. It's not interested in deep fried hawk legs. And Marco Come stand says, stand over here, Marco. Yep. Stand under my branch. Stand, stand under, under my, my branch. branch. <laughs> oh, my God. I missed it. I actually, entirely. this is one of those moments <laughs> I, I remember from entirely. when I was a kid because I didn't understand what the implication was, but I knew everyone was laughing. <laughs> and then I finally got it and I felt like oh, I was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> the crassness. <laughs> Cassie says, everyone laughed except me. I hadn't slept much. It wasn't the dream this time. It was the memory. The dream had become real. And what sleep I had was broken by images of myself, scared and shivering, while the Valique hovered above us and finally dove on Marco. I didn't like that memory. I don't mind being scared. We're all scared. But I didn't like knowing that I had kept myself safe at Marco's expense. There was only one word for a person who would do that. Coward. This is Cassie's internal monologue, but Jake just hops right on with their conversation, which is like, okay, based on our report from Axe, the Valik is like an insect swarm, and when they sense a type of energy they're chasing, they all gather together to make a creature. And Visor 3 has altered it to work on morphing energy. Which, I, like I said earlier, Axe points out, is apparently very simple. Very easy to do. And Rachel's like, oh, it's just like training a hunting dog. And I'm like, yeah, altering a creature's programming. Did they mean Did they mean basic conditioning? Yeah. Like, is that what they yeah, meant? Like, yeah, it's but, unclear. Like, they are like, okay, so it's big, it's scary, it may be unbeatable. And Cassie's like, no, no, no. It couldn't pick up Rachel. So it has limits. And... Though we don't have a lot of detail, water was somehow used to control it, like to to tame it somehow. And they're like, so what do we do? And Cassie's like, "Okay, so I have a plan, but I have to be the one to do it. And then she doesn't share it with us. Yeah. No, we don't get she to know. Well, she gonna... tells the group. No, and she what, says, who does she I don't want to scare the readers. Is. I know. <laughs> but she tells the group. Yeah, and Ka- and Jake says, Cassie, this is beyond dangerous. Why should you do it? Because I looked at Marco and met his gaze. I let the Valique take Marco. I could have morphed. I could have drawn it to me. I let it take Marco. I love this. Marco smiles wryly and says... Cassie, it's no big deal. Here I am, fine and healthy and as cute as ever. <laughs> and in true Anna Dork's tradition, this is where I take poetic license with the text. And I say, Cassie then went on to say, no, Marco, don't fucking try and laugh this off. I wanted you dead. <laughs> and I saw, <laughs> I saw my opportunity and I thought it would work. And now, having not succeeded, the only avenue i can understand is the separate crew like act of selflessness <laughs> oh man rachel also tries to join in and be like you you're calling yourself a coward like you've been in every fight you are not a coward 
And then Cassie calls Rachel Xena warrior princess. Right. She's like, easy for you to say. And, and then Rachel doesn't remember whether or not she likes that nickname. Honestly, I think Rachel remembers it and is trying to maybe, maybe quash <laughs> it. Like, you remember how I think you looked into it and like we didn't see it again after like book 10? I think maybe she's going to finally yeah, kill it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then so she tries to make a joke to distract being like, so Marco, do I like this or do I kick yeah. your ass right now? And then Cassie's like, nice try, Rachel, but you can't distract me. I'm doing... This crazy thing because I couldn't kill my best friend, Mark. This crazy thing that I won't tell the readers yeah. about. And then, like, I understand that we should be having little, like, n- you know, neurons going in our brain, figuring out what's coming next. But I do like that this chapter ends with an, all right, Jake said heavily. Let's go to the beach. <laughs> beach episode. Beach. It's the Let's beach episode. We cut back to Tobias, who we also yes. don't get a lot. He's from. catching a beautiful thermal. Caught in a beautiful thermal, rock hard oh thermal, ascending um, high into the I sky. Actually, I was excited when we got a bunch more Tobias here at the end, but I don't actually feel like he gets to do that much. Yeah, no. So Tobias is like singing the songs of the thermals and. Thinking about how it's crazy that Cassie feels like the weak link in the group when he slept through the entire second third of the book. And he's embarrassed and he's frustrated, but he's happy that Cassie gave him a role in this plan. (laughs) And it's not a role he's particularly well suited for. Yeah, because red tailed hawks have uh, trouble flying over the ocean, right? Over water. Yeah, he says there's not good thermals, but, you know, he gets up really high before he goes over the ocean. We don't know what he's looking for at first. No, but he's scanning the ocean beneath him. He's looking for something. And then he sees it. A spout in the water. And it was closer to shore than he thought it would be. And he, he turns back and he sees it plowing majestically through the waves. And he heads back to shore. And as soon as he's close enough, he uh, thought speaks to Cassie and he says, I have one for you, Cassie. I found a whale. Now, here's the thing I want to know. How would a bird of that size carry a whale (laughs) back to shore? Does it? It could (laughs) grip it by the husk. (laughs) You're telling me that a a red tail talk of that size, non migratory bird. It sticks its uh, one talon into the blowhole like a bowling ball and carries it that way. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. Hey, Rachel's leg got the shattered hawk, earlier. It's so the, whole, good. <laughs> the whole hawk would probably fit <laughs> yes, the whole hole. And please, <laughs> please don't make porn of what I just said. Don't make porn of it, but make like really soft core. A follow up to like, that. I do want to see it. I want to. I want to see if I'm into it. <laughs> I promise you, Chris, make, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Marco is fat shaming people at the beach. Yeah, Marco, yeah. Edgelord. <laughs> David him. Hasselhoff kicks anybody off the beach who isn't good looking. We mm-hmm. need the Hasselhoff law here. <laughs> and Rachel's yeah, great, like, so great. you wouldn't mind never going to the beach, Marco? No. And then this is a Cassie chapter. So like Cassie's inside her own head. She's like awaiting the moment to go here. They're at the beach waiting for Tobias's reconnaissance. But one little detail that she gives while she's assessing the situation about how like Marco's just telling jokes, trying to relax everybody, but he's doing that because he knows that I'm still devastated about the choice I Mm -hmm. made to kill him. Like she's running through everybody trying to figure out what the vibe is, but she gets to Jake and she just says simply, Jake was just one big tension machine, which yeah. as someone who's been in partnerships <laughs> with big tension machines, it's like, it's a fucking vibe. He presses his lips together a little too hard and has a certain hooded look in his eyes. And Rachel's was good. Rachel's was still quiet. I think the experience of Rachel's losing her good. memory had shaken her up. Rachel is someone who is always in control. She's very brave at dealing with threats, but this was something new to her, a threat. That had come from inside, which I think Jake also knows well like after that. book six, though. Yeah. Um, Marco was trying too hard to tell jokes and make everyone relax. He felt somehow he was responsible for my feeling bad. He wanted to tell me that he didn't blame me, 
but he'd already told me and I'd said thanks and still I felt bad. Marco didn't know how to deal with that. So he tried to make everyone laugh. He's, He's a, a good, good guy. Yeah. He's, He's a, good, a egg. good egg. So they're walking on the beach. Do, 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 do. Tobias flies up and says, I have one for you, Cassie. I found a whale where we ended last chapter. And then we sort of start getting a flavor of the plan, but we don't get exactly what's going to happen. And they're really trying to surprise us, but show us. And um, this is my favorite part because Cassie's going to do this. And then Jake cuts in. You don't have to do this, Cassie. The force of the impact, if you hit too fast, besides maybe the Vleek isn't even around anymore. And then Rachel even cuts in and is like, I could do this for you. And then Cassie is like, fuck off. And here's our clue. It's so good. Do three morphs, six changes, including one that's totally new, all that quickly. You all say I'm the fastest morpher, the one who gets control over the new morph easiest. I'm the person for this job. So whatever she's going to... Put, Put me, me in, in coach. coach. And whatever she's going to do, it's going to happen very quickly. And we're going to see a triple morph. And I feel like Cassie is going to do more morphs more quickly than Marco did while he was falling a much greater distance. They're in the water. They splash into the cold surf. They turn into dolphins, right? They turn into dolphins. They do. They get to swim as dolphins. And we boys. get to yeah. be reminded about the momentary bliss and joy. Because Cassie's about to do this thing that's hella hard. And they're about to dolphin out to this whale. And Mm -hmm. she gets to experience the joy and simplicity of the brain, which is something that I empathize with. Those moments of blissful. Yeah. Yeah. Those moments where you're so caught up in the moment and having a good time. Sometimes I even feel those while we're doing this podcast, y'all. Just getting a little, just getting a little tender. All right, let's Mm -hmm. move on. So they're morphing and because they're morphing, the Valique is coming for them. It's hovering over the water as they're right. swimming because it doesn't like water. We know that. It's just hovering. And so they're like, okay, part one of the plan yes. worked. We're going to swim out as dolphins and find this whale. They get to the whale. And this is where shit gets really, really cool because they get to the whale and the whale starts asking questions. Which they find with echolocation. I feel like oh, that's a good they detail. Find the, yes, they find the whale with echolocation. Yeah. The whale starts doing that whale thought speak that we saw in book four. And he says, little one. Strange cloud above. <laughs> and they're like, boy, do we know it. Yeah. And, and then <laughs> and then Cassie, this is the part that really blows my mind. Is like Cassie, like, it's like someone who can wiggle their ears. It's like if mm. I sit here and try and wiggle my ears, I literally have no idea what musculature to activate. But Cassie's yeah. just like, I'm gonna speak whale right now. And she just says to the whale, <laughs> Great one, do not dive. And the whale waited while she acquired its morph. Well, yeah, because she so she morphs back to human. Mm -hmm. And while she's doing that, Rachel and Jake slide up to her to pick her up. Yes. And carry her over to the whale, gasping for breath above the ocean. Because we're out in the fucking ocean. Right, but she also has to just barely be above the ocean because she can't get caught in human form before getting the right, whale morph. Two feet up is where they say the Valique is hovering. There's a really intense texture break here when she demorphs where they say, and this is like only kind of bad, dolphin tail split to become legs. Hate this next mm. line. My flippers sliced into fingers. Sorry, Ooh. bud. Just like we're having a moment. I don't. That's not again with this transitive intransitive thing. I, can you use sliced that way? Probably not. Isn't sliced something that has to take an object? You have to slice I would something. something. That would make more sense. Yes. You don't just slice. Right. And I agree with that part of it. But then the other thing is just texturally, it's all wrong. Like it's like just yeah. just say split. Like it's kind of it painful in a way. It's, it's painful like, in a way, and yeah. it's just like why are you put like I understand that morphing is gory. I appreciate the consistency, but let's have a nice time touching this whale. So we get a little <laughs> bit as Cassie's absorbing the morph of her feeling that acquiring the. I think it's not just morphing and uh, acquiring morphs in general, but acquiring this morph felt wrong as if she should have asked the whale's permission. She apparently could have. She struggled with this back in book four with the dolphins. And she especially even then hinted that she would really struggle with the idea of like morphing a whale because it's something that she believes has a soul. This really is like what we are seeing is Cassie boiling. Like if Cassie was in a simmer in four in book four, She's she's at a boil here. Like, yeah. she's yeah. just like, no, I have my priorities. I know my outcomes. I know what I want. 
and my ethics are like in dialogue with that but like oh my god i have to move and i have to go now and there's yeah yeah, Yeah. which is like like you were saying just like what we've wanted to see from her for so long it's it's so um unfun and uninteresting to just have her be so innocent yeah but not that i think not that she's not innocent just that like uh, like untested it's like she's such a good character you just want to see her go through it yeah and i actually think it makes this one of the more satisfying Agreed. character payoffs. What happens here? I think like up maybe I don't I don't know if it's up there with Rachel. And maybe it is, because I feel like we really do see a full arc here. But I guess we'll get yeah. into it. Yeah. I mean it came late in the yeah. book. Like Cassie was picked up in the back half of the book as a main character, but like mm-hmm. it's a it's a good payoff. I think it's a really yeah. good payoff. So we go to Tobias who's flapping as hard as he can, getting and as high as he can out over the ocean. And we find out that he's carrying someone like yeah. he, yep, he's carrying as little, a cockroach. Mm-hmm. Yep, little baby cockroach so, Cassie. Like, somehow the Valik is hovering just above her head, and like, <laughs> like mm. it's just wild. It's this plan is wild because like here's one thing that I thought you could just morph something light enough for the Valik to get and let it carry you up. That's not a bad idea, but. You would then have to demorph and remorph. And in the if you're not far enough away from shore, there's a chance. And you, yeah, you yeah, don't know where you are. There's a chance that you would drop on the land, which would be bad. Right. But the others, so Rachel, Jake, and Marco are actually down there half morphing, like half demorphing out of dolphins and morphing back in to keep the Valik's attention focused specifically on them. Once Cassie has completed her morph so that she and Tobias wow. can go through it. Just yeah. nuts. And so that's working for now. It's keeping their attention. And Tobias is working so hard to get up. I, apparently there are no thermals. There's another thermal watch in here, but apparently there are no thermals over the sea. So he's just doing all this like flying and flapping and getting up. And one would imagine that like flying without wind assist and without wind to fly into is just like doing pull-ups into the air like Mm -hmm. it just must be utterly exhausting yeah and as they're climbing higher and higher he knows that every foot he can get her is critical to her task is buying her time to do these morphs as she will apparently be pulling off the marco axe move of plummeting back to earth with the valik attached they have a really good conversation i think we all want to hit it you want Cassie or Tobias? I'll be Cassie here. Okay, okay. So it's should we start with Tobias? Yeah, Cassie. I think this will work. If I get you enough altitude, it'll work. Are you ever afraid? Who, me? I'm afraid of everything. I know I'm a predator and all, but do you know how many predators I have after me? Every golden eagle, every falcon. You know how fast they are? It's like getting hit by a bullet. They make me look like the Goodyear blimp. Then there are the raccoons and foxes and snakes and even the occasional nervy house cat. And that's just the natural environment. Add that to the yerks and the fact that I wake up sometimes and don't remember exactly what I am, boy or bird. Yeah, Cassie, I'm afraid a lot of the time. How do you handle it? Who says I handle it? There's only one way to deal with fear. Be afraid. Be afraid and then go ahead and do what you have to do anyway. Yeah, I guess that's true. Listen, Tobias, if I don't make it... Oh, shut up. You're going to make it. If I don't, if I don't, you know, then tell Jake that someday he has to tell my parents, okay? Someday, if it's ever safe, tell them what happened to me. Promise? Sure, Cassie. I promise. Just don't tell my dad what happened to his truck. He thinks it was stolen. We'd better leave it at that. (laughs) Cassie? This is it, kid. I don't know why he fucking says that. <laughs> it's very Chris it moment, is. actually. Yeah, <laughs> this is it, kid. I can't go any higher. Okay, Tobias. Thanks for the ride. And then she scuttles down, <laughs> Tobias. She <laughs> scuttles. I think it's really it's great. beautiful. Uh, it's really great. Moment. It's yeah. like it. And he says to himself, he thinks to himself, you know, this is a girl who's become a cockroach, now falling to the earth trying to draw a monster toward her and he thinks a girl who thought she was a coward it's amazing how people can just not know themselves at all (laughs) i really like that it feels like a very folksy 
thing to say. Yeah. Because it also, it's like, A, it's folksy and it's nice and it's nice for the Cassie thing. But I also feel like in my heart, it was a little bit, I had this feeling of like, he doesn't know himself either, you know? Like, and you know, we all know that even if he doesn't get to do the exciting stuff, he's living a really, really hard life and he's not giving himself enough credit for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a really good point. Yeah, and it's just nice to have this exchange between these two characters that we have. Yeah, they like haven't missing. interacted yeah. too much. And I always thought that they were two characters that I would really like to see interactions. Yeah, between. totally. Yeah. I, I don't feel like we get to see Cassie be vulnerable. Like Cassie yes. is the one who, even if the group doesn't agree with her, she's the one who has like the, the ethical point of view. She's the one who mm, seems like yeah. she always has an answer to something. She's asking for an answer to this she doesn't know like she's yeah um, and she's she's scared yeah and really beautifully and fascinatingly she's asking someone who is so on the outs yeah like you know tobias is protected by the group and supported by the group but like he was an outsider when he joined the group and i think that there's something about her ability like maybe it's a coincidence that they were the ones doing this part of it. So she asked, but I don't really think it's a coincidence. I think like she's wanted to ask and Tobias was the person to ask. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels purposeful. The whole moment feels purposeful. Yeah. And even Tobias, who also we know he's got a very scary life, but we also get the impression a lot of the time that he is in control of it. His answer to her is. Who says I can handle it? There's only one way right. to deal with it. You just right. are afraid and you keep on doing what you have to do. Yeah, so it's, there's yeah. no it's this yeah. idea that there's no such thing as handling fear. It's you have to accept being afraid. That's the way to like you can't dance around it. There's no way to manage it. Yeah. You just have to accept that you're afraid and keep going. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is we don't really get a full arc to it, so I hope it picks up again in his book, but um Axe's moment with meeting Visser 3 and knowing he's supposed to kill him. That's yeah. his honor. That's his duty as an Andalite, but he's too scared to do it. I feel like it gets echoed across a couple of the perspectives yeah. here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Cassie's fallen toward the ground. Yeah. And once she starts to morph, the Valique looks up at her with its manifold mouths. Um, and we flip back to Cassie's perspective in chapter 43 here and the first thing she has to do is morph back to human yeah and there is an interesting thing here where like i'm not gonna belabor the point but her terminal velocity will shift (laughs) many times because i believe it's true that if you drop an ant from a plane its terminal velocity is low enough that it will not die like Mm -hmm. it will hit the ground and just start like its terminal velocity is not enough to kill it because like it on the wind is such that if you drop it, it hits its terminal velocity with wind resistance, like from six feet. And ah. It doesn't die. <laughs> so, yeah. like, a roach probably would not die being dropped from a plane. But she is not a roach anymore. She no. is on her way back to being a human. Yes. And it's difficult. She's She's already morphed the dolphin, morphed back, acquired the whale, Morphed the roach, and now she's morphing back to human again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she has to focus on it really hard, but she gets there as the Valique is coming up to her. But then, then, the new morph has to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's where she really starts to struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she feels it happening too slowly. I mean, this is literally a Titanic morph. Like, Titanic is the appropriate word. This is the biggest morph that has ever been done. And if she hits an iceberg, she's dead. Yeah. (laughs) And she can feel the Valique firing ropes of dust at her, wrapping around her tentacles. So even as she's falling too fast, she looks down and the cigar shapes of her friends as dolphins. Thought that was an interesting. That is interesting. Word yeah. choice. Didn't work for me. <laughs> Did not <laughs> work for me either. <laughs> We're too close. She didn't think she had enough time. But the Valik kind of slows her fall a little bit as it catches her. Yes. And she continues it- morphing. It yeah. was unclear if that was intentional yes. to use the Valique as a sort of parachute. Yeah. It's very I think interesting. It, I think it was hopeful, 
but not yes. maybe totally planned. Totally guaranteed. Yes. Yeah. I agree. Well, so at this moment, she's admitting I don't have the strength. I was I'm I'm beaten. And mm-hmm. she starts to feel the whale's brain brushing against hers, which we've seen with other morphs that the animal instincts yeah. Yeah. To take over. There's some kind of conversation that happens there sometimes. And she feels its instincts, its DNA memories. And she pleads to that whale brain, help me. And Oh, this is so amazing. Yeah. I'd like, this did not even hit me. Keep reading. I'm uh, sorry. So it says in a dream of falling and falling, I reached out to a dark, vast being that I could not define. It's like very faith, like the very, language of faith, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I reached out for the whale's strength. Morph, finish the morph, finish it, and then you can rest. And there's a line, it's a, yeah. And so that, to me, stands out. So I made it. I made a joke earlier about you know the last thing. The last chapter just says it is finished in the Bible. <laughs> The last words that Jesus says before he dies on the cross are, it is finished. Hmm. And I don't know, I this finish it and then you can rest. Mm. For some reason, it almost spoke to me as being reminiscent of a voice. And this is total stretch and totally not me saying that that Kay Applegate was saying she was writing a Jesus parallel here or saying that whales are God. I, I like that. And at the same time, it just feels like an obvious comparison because Jesus fell from the sky and took the bleak <laughs> into the water for our <laughs> sins. Uh, right, which, of course. Yeah. <laughs> In whale morph. In whale morph. They are. But no, I do I do see what you're saying, and I think that's a very, like, well, it's I, just I have the taste back to for that, it. Right, that yeah, thing yeah. about it feeling very faith-oriented, feeling yeah. very rooted in the language that we as, like, Judeo-Christian based Americans, not saying necessarily how we were like raised in faith or anything. Sure, 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 sure. But like growing up in a largely Judeo-Christian modeled society. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Like that's what we associate with prayer. Yeah, yeah. It is interesting that these books are so secular and yet I actually think the whale, the great one as they call it, those are the most like that's where we see, I think, the closest thing to a conversation about faith, right? Like, yeah, yeah, they literally have reached out to these great ones, the whales, in times of need a few times. And the uh-huh. whales have a cosmic vibe to them. It's the only thing they do e- e- yeah. more than the aliens do. So well, I would say I would say that the whales are the first creatures. I like I think a valid read of this, in, you know, in a dream I'm following, I reached out for the whale strength more, finish the more. A valid read of this, like we have little evidence to go on. One is that she's imagining what the whale would say, but in the text, it's italicized in whale speak. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's It's unclear whether it's, yeah, Yeah. it's unclear whether or not it's Cassie's self whale speak or if it's like, right. But so this is an important thing. Like she, like, there's a line she could, there's a, it seems like like it's dialogue. More finished, the more. And then line break, finish, finish it, and then right. you can rest. Who's saying exactly. what? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. She could have accepted what she heard from the beyond. And that is absolutely, if there is a collectivist whale spirit, we're talking about something beyond the animal experience that we've yet to experience. Every other animal has been absolutely plugged into its place in the chaos of the moment. Right. I'm a shrew. I'm about to get eaten by a hawk or a cat or whatever. But this whale is so big, it can do nothing but en- ensconce the larger picture. It's just about... Right. It, it's, it joins her being and it suddenly understands morphing, something yeah. that it, it's like, ah, I see, I see. Like, yeah, yeah. It's like her consciousness is being enveloped by one larger than her own as opposed to trying to take over the brain of the animal that she's in. Yeah. Which feels yeah. like something when we go into an analysis episode I'd like to like talk about is like, why is that valorized versus the collectivism you know it's like this idea that we're all connected that we're all one is a beautiful thing and i'm not saying that you can't be one in your uniqueness like i personally believe that but like it is interesting where that line gets drawn is what i'm trying to say it's like i'm why totally is, like, into the idea of discussing this more in the future yeah my initial response is that it's nazis 
No, <laughs> the entire reason that Cassie's book was so centered on consent, I think, is because that is the difference. This is a ah. willing joining of a group mm. consciousness as opposed to a hostile takeover. Got it. Got yes. It. So not a yes. swarm. Yes, not a swarm, a collective. Right, mm-hmm. sort of. A cooperative. A cooperative. Mm. Yes, uh, with and which means that what we're seeing is, while it might be anti-communist, it could be pro-anarchist. <laughs> that I think, but that might be the flavor distinction is like ants, ants just fall in line. So we cut to Rachel and the other friends viewing Cassie falling to earth. Yeah, it's, a re- it's this is this is the bo- this is uh, the world's first reaction video. Yeah, yeah, they see the Valique catching her and slowing it down as it tries to carry it, her large heft, but then then it's falling faster. <laughs> the last bit they see of her, she's starting to get some bits of humpback whale, but mm-hmm. after she's ensconced, suddenly they are. Plummeting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because there is a full grown humpback whale yeah. mm-hmm. inside the valley. And Which they, is merely a kind of dust. Yeah, <laughs> are falling to the ocean. And the Valique does not let go in time. It tries yeah. to break free, but it does not. At the very to. least, most of it is submerged with yeah. Cassie as she goes into the water. We get a big sploosh. <laughs> Marco's favorite sound to make. And with it, it slams into the water and then it just washes away. And then we have this moment where did she make it? Mm-hmm. Is Cassie alive? Is That's right, because that... Cassie slams into the water. And immediately shoots 50 feet straight down. Yeah. yeah. And the Valique is gone. So yeah. we've succeeded there, but. Uh... They're calling out to Cassie, 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 are you all right? And there's a moment where there's no answer. And then there's a big kick from her massive whale tail. And she goes. And she says, let's fucking go! <laughs> <laughs> She says, take that, you big bag of wind. (laughs) And she kicks her way to the surface. She does a little whale jump. She's like, hey, what? Hey, this is three. I washed your dog for (laughs) you. Yeah. Um, And Jake really undersells it. He goes, good job, Cassie. Scratch one Valique. (laughs) <laughs> and, but Marco, and Marco, Mar- yeah. Marco's not even yelling. Like he doesn't even have exclamation points. He's like, "We actually won one. We won." Flat out kicked its butt. <laughs> Which um, he's a very butt oriented. Butt oriented, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like with the Dallas Cowboys and whatnot. <laughs> but then Cassie starts to sing in whale form. Does a whale song. song in the form of whale? Yeah. Song in the form of whale. That's very good. <laughs> Sorry for you. Sorry Take, for you. But um, Jake asked her what she was singing in form of whale, and um, what are the words? And she's like, "Jake, you stupid and cultured ass, <laughs> you pleb. They aren't words exactly. It's Italian." <laughs> <laughs> he says, "But if it were, it would just be one word." Hope. Hope. <laughs> Another two and optimistic endings in a row. I know. <laughs> I like the first Megamorphs book. Yeah, I, I liked it too. It. I, I liked, loved it. I liked that it told a more complete story. Like, I get that the books are a bigger series and that they're also trying to tell sort of a complete story. But yeah. I liked getting all the different facets and like feeling. The rise and fall of like a shorter narrative and getting to experience a whole narrative with them in one book instead of seven slash actually 54. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like this book meets us especially well where we're at. Like, you know, I think when (laughs) we started this, we really thought that we'd be doing like a book and episode and we'd be doing sort of a faster pace analysis, but like. This book, like, we've been so obsessed and zoomed into the minutia, which, like, I think is right for us. Like, it feels right to me. Like, I think the exact literary texture of this book is intoxicating, and I yeah. love yes, it. Yes, I totally um, agree. Yeah. But I do think that this book actually is the perfect book to have done after our, you know, one through seven any percent speed yes. runs. 
Is it? It's a cherry on top of the cake. It really is. It's, it uh, is. Yeah. And I think it's, I get why they did it. I get why they wanted to have more complete content where you didn't have to keep buying the series even. Like you could yeah. buy one, see if you like it, and yeah. get a good sense from one book what it's actually going to feel like to read the other books all at once. Like yeah. It's yeah. a lot of fun. It's a very fast paced book, though. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with everything that you're both saying. And I, I'm just happy that it was also it's weird. It felt like it was going to be a Rachel book, but it ended mm. up being a Cassie book. And I think it, they actually kind of shared it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the trade off happened. I think it's all those little parts of this book. Like, I, yeah. I think it's like when Cassie was worried and Rachel was like, snap out of it. And that being sort of like, it's like you imagine in the video game, your avatar just shifts and suddenly yeah. you're playing from Cassie's <laughs> perspective. Yeah, yeah. But it was such a powerful little flip. And that level of complexity has been missing from these books. And it makes sense because they're kids. I like I famously famously as into the two of you have said, like, I think back to our childhood and I think about the things that were going on in friends of ours lives and just think about it from an adult's perspective. And I can sit here and be like, whoa, so and so was having a real rough time that year. Yeah, I can't imagine what they were feeling. But like when I was in middle school, I could not imagine. And, you know, I'm not saying I can like empathize or like be in the shoes of anyone, but it's just like. It the books really get that part right in the first seven books. And then to get to this one and sort of be shown more complexity was really yeah. rewarding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just really good. I, I have one last question, I think. What did we think of our first introduction to X? Oh, as a narrator. Yeah. The narrator? He was totally a- competent narrator. Yeah, yeah, that's like he was a very concise narrator. Yeah. He didn't have a ton of personal flair, but in a book like this, that is sort of a mark on its own. Because it's different than Jake's lack of personal flair. Although, Jake has personal flair at this point. Yeah. There was a time when he Jake does, read very bland. He does shine out of narrator role. Yeah. Like, he, he shines he shines when other people are talking about him. Yeah. But, I don't know, to see the internal workings of X, in terms of his thoughts, seemed much like I suspected they would. But they were still delightful to read, and I was happy to have them. <laughs> and he was more, I think, and we talked about fear a lot in this book, but I think it was interesting. Axe has kind of been a joke, I feel like, outside of, like, yes. he's comedic yes. relief alongside. Yes. That's probably yeah. part of the reason, besides the fact that they're dating, of course, that he gets paired with Marco <laughs> so much. But he was scared in this book, and that was interesting yeah. to see, too. And I'm sure we'll get more of that in the next book. Yeah, it was nice to get a little taste of it, though, I think, before, yeah. like, get a t- sense of what he's like and how he's going to read, because he reads like a kid who's pretending not to be a kid. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And that's an interesting, that's an interesting take, and I want to see if that's, if that keeps being true. Yeah. I liked his willingness in in that sort of like adultness of him, I liked his discerning decision making in his scene where he was thwarting the viscer. Like yes. I just, yeah. I he liked just him being like, and he does "Stomp it. your feet, yeah, stomp your feet, yeah." Like, and I touch I the think panel, something... think open hatch. Why yes. would I touch the panel? Panel and think, think open, open hatch. hatch. Yeah, like, trust Jake's me. Leadership. Yeah. Exactly. Ooh. I want to see a Rachel Jake axe face off the three of them like well, i that, thought you were gonna say love triangle love but triangle, i was yeah. really really afraid that that's what you were gonna say i imagine no um, axe is thinking axe, uh, well axe, axe is yeah. in the middle it's they both like axe right. but axe likes mark rachel ah. canonically said he was cute yes that's true axe needs a, a hand a hand song like a, a song with hands <laughs> both hands now uh yeah uh, oh no 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 no! Take my hands. Take my hands. <laughs> take my and, whole life too. No 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 no! But no, like I it's know, like I'm no no no! It's, it's, it's like not an. Chop it's off not, my hand, but then kill me. It's not an axe song. It's a Marco song. Oh. And, and Axe has just saved Marco's life by dehanding the foe, and then he changes the meaning of that by saying, "I want you to take my hand 
in marriage. Oh. And then I get and then it. Axe explains that that's not a higher form of love thing. That's like It's a actually a lower thing. form of love. Yeah. yeah. Anything but the I, government is involved in is a lower form of or, love. Or or hold on. No, we do it in act 1 as a battle song. And then we pivoted to a love song in Act Two oh. when they feel, realize they're in love, and it's when, I take when, my hand. Yeah, when Axe and Marco realize that the battle they've been fighting with each other is actually not a battle at all. Mm. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's all beautiful. Right. Thanks for listening to Anadorks. We'll be back soon with lots more to say. Until the Andalites return, or at least until next time. See you soon. Bye.